All Saints Lutheran Church is a ministry of word and sacrament. We believe, teach, and confess that Jesus Christ descends to us and is truly present with us and for us in the divine service, where he delivers his good gifts to us through the tangible, physical means of word and water, bread and wine. Communion with God involves our whole selves, including our bodies, in participation with one another and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not meant to happen inside our heads, isolated in front of a computer screen. We are glad to offer you these video recordings and online resources to enable you to hear the word, but this can never be a replacement or substitute for the in-person divine service. While extenuating circumstances may justify temporary separation, we look forward to the day when we can receive Christ's gifts together in the divine service.
today where Jesus promises to be among us as one who serves, giving us the gifts of life and salvation. As we begin today, uh, uh, we have heard up here to tell us a little bit about Oktoberfest. I'm thinking a little bit uh, excited about this, maybe just a little. So I'll let him uh, share an announcement about that. Good morning. So ever since I walked into the church today, it's been nothing but Oktoberfest. So that is this Saturday at 11 o'clock until 2. Actually, we end about 2.30 after we uh, draw names for all the raffle prizes. Uh, we have more than we've ever had as far as donations from businesses, um, from members, friends. Uh, we have over tw about 24 new businesses that Peggy and I have visited this year. Um, and I've got to say, Peggy's got about 75% of the items that we have this year. And everybody is just excited to donate because we're giving money to the LCMS Southeastern uh, Disaster Relief Fund for the Carolinas. Uh, they all pipe up when we say that. And they're like, here you go, take, have fun. Um, we do a poster for all the businesses that donate. Uh, but most important, we have a program set for Saturday. Uh, in the midweek, you'll see an outline of when the events will happen. So you have an idea of when um, the Meteorworks TV contest is, which is at noon. There's eight people signed up for that. Pastor is the reigning champion, so <laughs> he has to eat his with his hands behind his back. Um, you know, we've got, we've got the Oompa Band, we've got all kinds of activities, the Cornhole. Uh, we're going to have quite a few silent auction items this year, so be prepared if you would like to put your bid on that. Um, God, I could just go on and on about it. It's, um, just come have fun. It's a great time. Thank you. It's a great opportunity for us all to get together and also support some worthy causes, so hope to see you there. Uh, there's a, a, another announcement. Uh, we've got a lot of folks in our congregation, of course, who are Deep in love, our, 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 our brothers and sisters, our, our, our friends in Christ, the Ebersons, um, and uh, wanting to know how to help. Uh, and so um, we have a couple of opportunities and ways for our members to help the Ebersons. Uh, first of all, we're going to have a couple of work days at their home on October 27th and 28th to kind of prepare their home for the birth of the, the baby and for uh, the place to be a comfortable and safe place for, uh, for Rachel after surgery and uh, treatments and recovery and so forth. So if you'd like to come and, and work on those days and help out, there's a sign-up sheet in the Narthex for that. Also, uh, many have requested uh, another way to, uh, or another path, a way to give uh, financial contributions to help and support them other than the GoFundMe, which of course takes a cut uh, from that. And so uh, after discussing with elders and council and so forth, we, we would like to, uh, for the next two weeks, have a, a fundraising drive to help the Epperson family. We'll have <coughs> door offerings the next two Sundays. Uh, you can put that stuff in the plate, uh, donations to them in the plate. Or if you want to designate on your envelope and put that in the offering plate, we're welcome to do that as well for those two Sundays to give us you know, a little bit of a boost of, of money to uh, help with their with their needs. So that those two opportunities are coming up here, uh, and uh, you can participate in that. Uh, just one other announcement. Uh, uh, it seems early. Boy, does it seem early. We talked about Christmas poinsettias already, but uh, the way things go these these years is you've got to order early. So if you wanted to uh, purchase Christmas poinsettias, the deadline is October 29th. And, uh, and so you check that out as well. Uh, all right, I think that's it for our announcements. Uh, let us rise for prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice to be gathered here together as your people, where our Lord Jesus Christ serves us with gifts of life and salvation through word and sacrament. We pray that uh, by the power of your word, we would uh, hear and believe message of Christ for us, uh, Christ crucified and risen, uh, our Savior, and be blessed in this divine service today, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And
Say to my soul, I am your salvation. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. The Lord saved him out of all his troubles. This is God, our God, forever and ever. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from the Lord. Things that we have heard and known, that our fathers have told us. We will tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might, and the wonders that He has done. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. my soul, I am your salvation. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. The Lord saved him out of all his troubles. This is God, our God forever and ever. Almighty and merciful God, of your bountiful goodness, keep us from all things that may hurt us, that we, being ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish whatever you would have us do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Testament reading for the 19th Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis. 
Genesis chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowds saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority 
to men. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the God from his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, the God of not faith, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, for our salvation came down from heaven, and was the triumph of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered in his grave, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. 
text for our meditation today is the epistle reading, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23 through 24. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Every once in a while you'll hear the account of someone who, whose life was radically changed by a near-death experience. Some kind of terrible accident occurred, there was a, an incurable disease or a heart stopped on the operating table in the ER, pronounced dead, about to pull the plug. Somehow, some way, the person made it. He was revived, he survived, he was spared death. Everyone had given up hope. But a miracle happened and his life has never been the same since. A near-death experience like that has a tendency to change a person. And people who've gone through something like that often talk about how the experience has changed their lives. Where before they took their life for granted, now they see life as a gift. Where they kind of just plodded along through life, doing whatever came to hand. Now they realize how skewed their priorities had become, how time is a precious gift not to be wasted, how skills and talents that once were used for selfish gain ought now be used in the service of others. They also have a tendency to see uh, earthly possessions for what they are, limited to this life and thus to be shared rather than hoarded because you can't take them with you. How would your life change if something like that happened to you? I can't imagine that your life wouldn't be changed. And that's the Paul that that's the point that the apostle Paul is making in our epistle today. Like a near death experience, our rescue from sin and death and hell changes us. It changes our lives, changes our priorities, changes our perspective. It gives us a new appreciation for God and His gifts. It motivates our evangelism. We have become new people and will never be the same again. Paul says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul speaks first of all about the old self. That old self belongs to the old life, the life before our rescue, the life of sin, the life of living for self, the life of rebellion against God, the life lived blinded by the devil, depraved in soul, no fear of God, no trust in God, a life characterized by disobedience, given over to lust and pride and greed and envy and hatred. Of course, his audience is a little bit different from this audience in that most of the Ephesians were converts from paganism and probably most of the people in this church grew up in a Christian home and probably cannot recall a former life without Christ's uh, knowing of Christ's love and knowing of Christ's forgiveness, having the Spirit of God given in baptism. The Ephesians were, as I said, predominantly Gentile converts to Christianity. They had learned Christ. They were taught in Him to put off the old self. And there was a very stark difference in their minds between the former life and their new life. But, as it seems here, they were apparently having some difficulty cutting ties completely with those old ways of living and being. 
they still had to live and function in a pagan world which was constantly pulling them back to their old life, back to that old self. Paul describes the former life of the Ephesians in the words preceding our epistle. Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness. So that perspective given in those words preceding our text is important because their situation is not unlike our own. Now, we may have grown up in a Christian home, um, not remembered a time before we were baptized and had the Spirit of God, some of our older members may remember living in a society that seemed at least to be largely Christian. But that has changed. And the pull of the world is strong on us. Our world more closely resembles the Gentile world of the first century now. And that pull of that world is strong. And it's compounded by the fact that the old Adam within us actually agrees with the world and its priorities. Christians are those who have been rescued from the life of sin, rescued from the life of living for self, the life that the world promotes, characterized by disobedience and lust and pride and greed and envy and hatred. Take note that Paul says that is the old self. This is not the new self. The Christian self, the Christian life, is a new life. And that new life is different from the old life. Put off the old self, Paul says. And that's a warning to us just as much as it was to the Ephesians. Don't be deceived. Watch out lest you become a hypocrite. There are many who claim the name of Christian but have no difference in their lives. They excuse sin rather than repenting. They embrace their sin rather than waging war against it. The Christian is one whose life has been radically changed by the power of the gospel. Their neighbors can see a difference in their lives. Indeed, their rescue from sin, death, and the devil has so impacted them that everything has changed. They have new priorities. They hate their sin. They repent of their sins. They receive forgiveness in word and sacrament. They desire to keep God's commandments. They discipline their hearts and minds and bodies so that they can conform their life to God's command. They love. They love others as Christ first loved them. Paul gives concrete examples of this radically changed life in the final verses of our epistle and the verses that follow. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share 
with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up and fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And those are pretty clear. They don't require a lot of explanation. This is what the life of the new self looks like as it is lived out in relation to our neighbors. The Christian is to put off the old self and put on the new. How does that happen? Well, Paul teaches us that it begins with being renewed in the spirit of your minds. Think about that. A near-death experience can totally change your life, as we said. But I want you to take that example to another level today. Because you see, the Christian life, the new self, is not the result of a near-death experience. It is the result of being raised from an actual death experience. This is what Paul writes earlier in Ephesians. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You hear that, right? You were dead. You were children of wrath. And that means that though you were alive bodily, you were dead Spiritually, and God's wrath, God's anger, stood piled against you. But Paul continues. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, that's not a near-death experience. That is being raised from an actual spiritual death experience to new life in Christ. And how can that not change everything for you? How can this rescue from spiritual death not change your life? You were dead. And now you're alive. You were going to hell. And now eternal life is your promised inheritance. This gospel, this good news of salvation, how can it not renew your mind? It must. If this gospel does not change you, you are no Christian. You are a fraud, a hypocrite. An ungrateful wretch who remains under the judgment of God. Now, that seems a little harsh. Well, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the Christian ceases sinning. I'm not saying that the Christian no longer struggles. No, in fact, Paul teaches in Romans 7 that life this side of heaven is a a battle between the old self and the new self. And so often when we look at our lives in the mirror of the law, we feel as if there is no change. And I think this is true as we grow in our faith and grow in our understanding of God's Word, sometimes what happens is we grow in the realization of the actual depth of our sinfulness, where before we had a sort of shallow understanding of how deep the problem was as we mature as Christians we begin to see that the problem is much deeper 
and also that the sol solution in Christ is so much greater. What I am saying is this, is that the Christian is no longer controlled by the old self. The Christian wages war against the old self. And that is, is and will be a fierce and bitter battle that will last until the very day that you die. But that old self is not the controlling principle of the life of the Christian anymore. And that's because Christians have been renewed in the spirit of their minds. They've been renewed by that glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Their lives, their priorities, everything has changed for them because they have been rescued from death and hell. And now their lives are characterized by faith in Christ and love for their neighbors. In view of Christ's mercy to them, they love others. In view of the free forgiveness they have received, they freely forgive those who have hurt them. You've seen it before. The survival of a near-death experience is changed forever. A new lease on life rearranges one's priorities. How much more then with the Gospel our resurrection from the death of sin to new life in Christ gives us new perspectives as well. Once a death sentence hung over your head, you had offended God. His anger burned. There was no hope. It was only a matter of time before you would be struck down eternally in your sin. But the God whom you offended chose not to strike you down. Instead, the Son of God offered Himself in your place and He was struck down for you. His death secured your complete forgiveness, paying the price for every one of your sins. And that forgiveness was in time applied to you as your sins were washed away in baptism. And that forgiveness is weekly given to you as you eat the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you are a new person. The old has gone. The new has come. A new outlook on life, new priorities, people to love and serve, and great joy to look forward to in the life to come. How can you not be changed? In the name of Jesus.
In our prayers today, we are uh, also, in addition to the names listed in the bulletin, uh, remembering uh, in prayer, uh, praying for comfort for uh, Gene Eng and his family as they mourn the death of his sister, Jane Lavones. Uh, also, uh, didn't get it into the bulletin this week, but rejoicing uh, in the uh, pregnancy of Melinda Rutkowski and their uh, family uh, rejoicing in that. So let us rise for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For clean hearts created by the forgiveness of Christ, that we may put off the old ways of sin and walk in the way of his commandments. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the ministers of the church that our God, who has given such authority to men to forgive sins, would focus their every word and deed toward this office of the keys, and that the gospel may predominate in our worship and life together. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Spirit of God, that he would fill our homes with his forgiveness and work righteousness and holiness among us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For mothers with child, especially Melinda, Rachel, and Lauren, that God would grant health and protection to both mother and child and safe delivery. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Joseph, our president, and all other leaders, that even as God rules the world by his mighty power, he would be pleased to give our nation wisdom, peace, and success in accordance with his commandments. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the family and friends of Larry and Jane who mourn, as well as Fanny, Gerald, Jennifer, John, Sylvia, Crystal, Arlene, Ken, Brian, Walter, Alan, Stetson, Cheryl, Juanita, Eric, David, Rhonda, Betty, Alvina, Larry, Cherry, Ebby, Brent, a student of Amy, Sue, Dale, Chrissy, Thomas, James, Ruby, Sarah, Jim, Christina, and Alicia, and all in need, that God would heal them and so show his greater power to forgive their sins in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who come to the altar this day, that they would see this as the very house of God and gate of heaven, where Christ is bodily present to forgive, heal, and renew us in true righteousness and holiness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of the grace of God, that we may be made whole in the forgiveness of sins, together with all those broken by this world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen.
Depart in peace, sins forgiven.